Hi, I'm Justin Hensley. I'm a senior member of technical staff in AMB's Office of the CTO, where I work in advanced technology initiatives. So this is part four in a series of videos about OpenCL. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about in this video, video four is a kernel execution. So in particular, we're going to be talking about execution and synchronization of kernels. Recall from previous videos, we've talked about program and kernel objects. So program objects encapsulate the program source or pre-compiled binary from disk, uh, a list of devices and the latest successfully built executable for each device, and a list of kernel objects. Our kernel objects encapsulate a specific kernel function in a program, and it's declared with the kernel qualifier, and also contains the argument values for this kernel. Kernel objects can only be created after the program has been built, so you can't just create a kernel object without first of creating a program object. So let's start. Let's say we have a program object here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have some kernel code. So that's shown on the left. We're going to take that kernel code and we're going to compile it for the GPU and that'll give us GPU code. But let's say we also have an OpenCL uh, device that is using the AMD CPU. In that case, we'll have to compile it for the CPU and we'll get x86 code for that. So we'll have two different kernel objects, two different kernel binaries, uh, one that'll run on the GPU and one that'll run on the uh, x86 CPU. Programs build executable code for multiple devices. So the key point here is that you can have the same high-level code uh, run on multiple different devices because at runtime, we can compile uh, the code for the devices that we have at runtime. So you could even have a system where you have you know, any number of these uh, devices compiled for. So you could have a GPU in the system, uh, x86 CPU, and even a DSP. So you would have three different sets of code in that uh, situation. Let's look at how we can compile kernels. So first we create a program. So the input is going to be a string, so source code, or a pre-compiled binary that we've loaded from disk. So you can kind of think of this as a dynamic library. It's a collection of kernels. We have multiple functions we can call into this program object uh, to do certain tasks. So let's say we're doing image processing. We might have something that would scale the size of the image, rotate an image, transpose an image, or any sort of uh, image operation. So once we've created that program object from uh, a binary or a source, we're going to compile that program. So we're going to specify the devices for which that kernel should be compiled, and then we're going to pass in compiler flags. OpenSeal has a standard set of compiler flags, and then the specific runtime you're using might have additional runtime flags. So this might be the level of optimization you want the compiler to use, uh, what kind of floating point math you want it to use, etc. You can also use this to check for compilation errors. So let's say you've, uh, you're just testing out a program that you just wrote. Uh, you could compile it, and then if it returns with an error, you can get a build log back that'll tell you the specific errors uh, of your kernel that you tried to compile. Once we've done that, we're going to create some kernels. So uh, we, we've created our kernels from a built program. We're going to get a kernel object, and that's going to hold the actual arguments for execution and what we actually send to the different OpenCL devices to execute. So once you've built and compiled your program objects, you need to actually create the kernels. So this is going to return a kernel object used to actually hold the arguments and the actual executable that will be run on the different devices. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a, a program object that is a CL underscore program. And then we're going to create program with source. So we have a context that we've created previously. We're passing in one set of uh, source files. And we have uh, no, our, in this case, we're not giving it any compile flag, so we're saying use all default compile options. And then we get our error back in the error field. We're compiling and creating a kernel. So once we've taken that program object, we've built it, and now we need to create a kernel. We're going to build a program as we did before. And again, we're passing in program. And in this case, we're just using all the default arguments because for this simple example, that's all we need to use. And then we'll check for our error. And this is actually showing us how we can actually get the build log. So we're going to use the CL build program build log flag to let us get back a log of what happened when we built. So if we actually had an error, we could get back this build log and it would tell us uh, all the information about where it failed when it tried to, to build this program. So in this case, we're going to simply uh, do a CL create kernel. So we're going to take our program object that we just built. We're going to tell it we want the average image kernel. And then we'll have an error flag. So we'll create a kernel object from that single kernel instance that is in that program object. Now that we've actually compiled our program objects and created our kernel objects, we actually want to execute our kernel. So there are two basic steps in executing a kernel. The first thing we need to do is set the kernel arguments. And the next thing we'll do is enqueue the kernel. So let's look specifically how you would uh, set the kernel arguments. So to set the arguments, we're going to use the function called clsetKernelArg. And in this case, the first argument is the kernel that we care about. 
The second argument is we need to tell at the index of the argument we want to set, the size of that argument, and then the actual argument. So in the first case, we're telling take kernel object named kernel, set the zeroth argument with a size of input to the value input, and then we're going to set the output at the same way we did with the input, but instead we'll say set the output. Then uh, we actually want to execute it. And so in this case, we're processing on images. So in this case, our n-dimensional domain will be two. So you'll notice that we have our global size there set to image width and image height. The third guard argument we don't really care about because in the next call, we're going to tell it we're only doing 2D operations. So in the next line, we actually enqueue the work. And we use clnq nd range kernel to actually enqueue the work. The first argument is the queue. So that's the particular queue we want to enqueue work to. The second argument is the actual kernel that we're uh, enqueuing. The third argument in this case is the actual uh, global domain size. So in this case, again, we're doing a 2D image, so we're going to tell it 2. The next argument we're not going to use. And then finally, uh, the next argument is global, and that's actually the size and width and height of our domain. And we're passing in uh, the width and height of the image that we're processing. The rest of the arguments are default for this simple case. We'll talk a little bit more about events later, and that's when we'll be using those last arguments. So here we know that we're executing our kernel asynchronously because I'm not passing in any events. So from previous videos I talked about, you need these events to actually synchronize your kernels. In this case, you're just requesting the OpenCL runtime to enqueue that task into a queue that will later be run. So nothing may happen. You, know, you might actually make this call and then it might take the runtime a while to actually get to the point where it can execute that kernel. Uh, you've only enqueued the kernel. You need to use a, something such as a blocking read, and that would be a seal in queue read with an argument of true with, uh, the block, for the blocking uh, argument. And when you use that, that's one way of forcing the runtime to flush everything and force the kernel to actually be executed. Again, though, when you do this in queue, it is not executed right away. It's done asynchronously. Another way of doing it is you can use events to track the st uh, execution status. So the reason you'd want to use events to do this is that allows you to have your host running uh, your host application not block on OpenCL calls. So you could actually multitask that way. So your host application can enqueue work, go off and do something else, and then come back and check to see if an event is done. And if the data is absolutely needed, it can force the data, uh, force the runtime to return uh, with the data once it's ready.